Hi, my name is Craig Thompsonwood. I'm the board game teacher. Thanks for coming to the classroom. Uh, for those of you who I've spoken to, whether it's been at conferences or in board game shops or uh, different events that we've been attending at the same time or wherever it may be, whenever I talk to teachers and I find out you're a junior teacher and they're looking for suggestions of games, invariably what I discuss is City of Zombies. Uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again. This is the best math game I've ever seen uh, for classroom use. It is absolutely amazing and I think that if you are a junior teacher, you should definitely be looking to begin this game. Now, what I thought would be prudent of me to do, seeing as I do talk about this game so much, is to talk about how do I use it in my classroom. If you are a teacher who's unfamiliar with board games or just looking to get started with City of Zombies, and maybe you already know board games but just want a bit of a, an idea of how to implement it, let me sort of break it down for you in my 10 easy steps to get City of Zombies into your classroom. So step number one is going to be purchasing the game. Now, City of Zombies is not a game that you can find easily, unfortunately. Uh, well, you can find it easily, but it's not readily available. Let me explain what I mean there, in that right now, as I understand it, the um, City of Zombies is not available anywhere in North America uh, through distributors, through regular distributors. This is something I've talked to the designer, Matthew Tidbury, about with regards to the game. Uh, when I last spoken to him about it, he still hasn't found any distributors for North America uh, distribution of the game, so it's not going to be widely available. Uh, however, it is available through Level Up Games. Uh, this is because Level Up and I, you know, we talk a lot about the games, and she worked with me on this. And uh, I've, I told her you need to get this game in your shop, and she has sold out of the game once. She's got more games in again. Uh, it's a great game, and uh, if you're looking for it, LevelUpGames.ca, LVL-UP.ca is the website and I'll put that in the link below right now so that way you can find it if you want to get it there and she will ship it to you if you can't find it or you can I guess just buy it directly and have it shipped from England which may be a little bit more expensive for that shipping but however you choose to do it I do recommend getting it. The second thing you need to do is you need to get groupings uh, for your students. I recommend groupings of five. I find groups of five students at one sitting is the best way to go. I happen to be very fortunate in that I have 25 students in my class, so it makes it very easy to do with 25, uh, so five groups of five. And so then I, once you know the number of students you have, so I mean, you're gonna have to maybe have a bit of wiggle room to adjust it if you have an, uh, a number that doesn't evenly divide by five, but I'll explain that, uh, how to do that in a little bit. So once you know the number you're looking for in your groupings, then you need to know their math ability. What I did at the beginning of the year is I used an arithmetic survey just to get a quick sense of their arithmetic abilities. Uh, I used what was called the Halton Arithmetic Survey, and you can just look that up online and print that off and give it to your students. It's uh, 60 questions, 30, 60 questions. It's, it's a number of questions that the students answer with uh, you know very simple questions. I think it starts with like one plus two, and then it goes all the way up to, you know adding with fractions, decimals, dollars, things like that. And it gets more difficult as it progresses. And you just take the raw score of that, you're given a great equivalent. Based on the great equivalent then, I, gave, I grouped my students into groupings of five students each. So I tried to make sure that the students are as close as possible in their groupings of abilities so that way when you're playing, you're not having one student who dominates it all by, because they're the best student. You want to make sure that all the students are about the same level. So by doing the survey, I got the great equivalents, and then from that, then I was able to group them accordingly. The third thing you're going to want to do is think about what time you're going to be doing the game. You want to do it at a time where you can do it regularly. Uh, it's not something you want to be doing once a month or once in a while, particularly with the groupings when people are waiting for their turn. You don't want them to be waiting weeks for their turn. You want the kind of this to be rotating through very quickly so every student is getting turns. And the more exposure they get, the more they practice, the better that's going to get. And it really pays off. So it's that kind of repetitious practice that's really going to be helping them the most. So you want to make sure that you're setting up a time and making it a part of your daily practice wherever possible. Now, I say daily practice, and I do it almost daily, but not quite daily because there is times where maybe I have other things going on in the morning that I need to deal with or 
um, just situations come up, then it's just not able to happen. But typically what I do is our school, the, the bell goes at 8.30, and we have a 20 minute period for announcements, agendas, and those kinds of things. So after the national anthem's over, after the announcements are over, we're boom, we're down to it. We're sitting down, we're playing City of Zombies until 8.50. Um, so we have that 20 minutes, it's a little less than 20 minutes, but that's the time we use to play City of Zombies every day. And I find that kind of regular repetition has really paid off with the students. And I even just had a teacher commenting today, a student she had last year, she was working with him on something uh, as part of our OFIP tutoring program yesterday. And she says, wow, I've really actually noticed uh, the confidence in his math abilities. And I attribute that to City of Zombies because he, he really does enjoy this game and he's, I see that his skills are growing and he is developing confidence in his math skills. So that's, that's a big plus for this one. So the fourth thing you're going to be doing is you're going to be determining the levels. And by levels, I mean the levels of the zombies. The zombies in this game um, go from one, which is the very easiest zombies, single digits, to four, level four, which are very difficult. You get like three digits, like 256. So you have to pick the levels of the zombies that you're going to be using for the students. You have to match up with the students. So if you have students who are a low functioning ability group, then you want to be using level one Level, I use level two uh, at the lowest. Uh, level one would be very simple. Level two, I, um, I use for my lower groups. And then the level threes, I don't have any students for the higher groups. I don't have any students who are ready for level four yet, I feel. But that's something that we can maybe be looking as we go towards the end of the year. Maybe I will try and bump up some of the higher groups to level four. And you know maybe they'd be up for that challenge. If you're doing level two zombies, I do suggest not using heroes. I think the students have enough challenge just figuring out how to work the dice to their advantage to, to match the numbers that they need. Level the, the, the heroes just add that extra level of complication that I think will just make it maybe a little bit more frustrating for them. As they get more familiar with the game, you might want to try it out, but I have found that I'd prefer to for my level two students to not have the heroes. And it also gives them something to look forward to when they get to the level three. So level three, Yes, use the heroes. Absolutely use the heroes. And level four, again, yes, you would definitely be using the heroes for level four. So as you're playing the game, what I do as I play the game is I pull out my cell phone. I pull out my cell phone and I have on it a timer and I uh, set it for 30 seconds. So I just leave it out on the table and once the students roll the dice, I hit start. Um, now, because remembering that City of Zombies is a cooperative board game, so the student during that first 30 seconds has to do it all on their own. He or she has to come up with whatever they can to figure out those dice. After the person who's rolled the dice has had their first 30 seconds, the team then has 30 seconds to make suggestions. So if the, this way, if the one person can't find any combinations to match the zombies numbers the rest of the team can then help at that time but I don't want them jumping in before I want to give that first 30 seconds for the student to try on their own to to see what they can do with it and if they come up with something early so say at 15 seconds in they said okay I'm going to do this I can stop the timer and ask the rest of the team are you happy with that or do you have any other suggestions And at that point they can chime in and this you know is one way too if it suddenly becomes obvious like there's only one zombie left in the dice I'll add up to that number, then hey, we're good. We don't need to question it anymore. So you can stop the timer early for that one. But it's also important to have that timer. I used to do a minute, but I found that was a bit long, particularly as it tends to run over time. So having 30 seconds and then another 30 seconds, it just gives, an, I think, a fair amount of time for the students to be able to figure it out. And if they don't figure it out within that time, then their turn is over and nothing, no zombies are removed and it goes on to the next person. So when I'm setting up the game, Normally in the game, you have the um, positions where the zombies start, and it's either the 15, 10, or five rounds. Um, I was starting off with five rounds, but I was finding that it was going a bit long. So what I do is I do start the timer at three. So there's only three rounds. The students get three rounds to play, and that, because that gives us the, you know, like I said, the five rounds just seemed too long for me, just because it was eating into our first, uh, or our second period from uh, 8.50 to 9.30. So I want to reduce the amount of how much time I was eating into that class. So I just um, put it down to three rounds and I find that is good. And that, that sort of uh, works well for us to um, be able to play and get enough time in there that the students feel like that they had a, a good run with it. So if at any time I'm missing a member, and this would happen if you have an odd number of students in your groupings, 
Uh, so say I have a group of five and one student is away that day, what I always do is I roll for that student at the end and then I just sort of skip the part where this, that student uh, would guess. I give the rest of the team the time. So I, I roll the dice, I say, okay, this is for Jack. Now Jack rolls the dice and Jack now has, you know, now the team gets to decide because Jack's not here, everybody gets to look at the dice and decide, okay, what are we gonna do with them and how are we gonna use those? So that way they're still getting the same number of rolls for the um, number, for, for their team, but they're not penalized because one, one of their members is away. So if you have a situation, like say you had 26 students, then you can either maybe have a group of six, uh, would probably be the best thing, but if you had a class of 24, then you'd have your four groups of five, one group of four, but that group of four would just get a bonus roll at the end where they could all figure out so that way it evens out. You know, you just have to sort of play with the numbers a bit and just wiggle it to make it work if you don't have, if you're not fortunate like me, and have exactly 25 students. Now one thing I do during the game is, uh, uh, when you're playing the game and if you wipe out the whole, all the zombies that are on the board, you get more survivors. Um, if this is done part way through a round, so say out of the five people, after the first three, they manage to wipe out all the zombies. So that means there's two people left still with the round. I will put out a new round of zombies at that point, and after those two are done, the zombies shift down. So this can make some interesting strategy choices because, because of the final thing that I do. Now the final thing that I do is one of the reasons why I think that the Cities of Zombies has been such a highly successful game in my classroom, and that's because we keep a high score of who has the highest score of the survivors. Who has achieved the highest number of survivors in any game within the three rounds. So in our current uh, class, the highest score ever was 36 survivors which is pretty fantastic. You know, when you think about it, you start with four survivors, the highest number is four, so the most you could have is 16. They have to wipe out the zombies several times. So needless to say, they had a really good run with it. They, they wiped out the zombies several times. They, they kept increasing, getting more cards with the survivors. And so that was 36. A couple groups have come close to beating that, but nobody has come has actually been able to do it just yet. So the, these, this group has been the, the leading one for uh, at least a couple months now. And, but every time it gets close, the other students start to watch. It becomes like a spectator sport. People cheer them on. And it's just, it's that kind of enthusiasm and excitement that really gets the people worked up over the game and gives them something more to look forward to than just playing a game. Overall, like I say, the game for the mathematical skills, for the collaboration skills, for the, the camaraderie of the class and everything and the excitement that it produces and just the confidence that it's building in my students for math really just makes this game such a solid choice for me as a daily classroom routine. As I've said before too, I just cannot highly recommend it enough for you in your classroom. Hi, as I was editing the video last night, I realized there was one part that I forgot to mention, so I thought I would add this little addendum onto the video right now. Uh, if you are going to be looking at the game from the perspective of doing it for the high scores, I would strongly recommend uh, removing a few of the heroes from the game because it makes it a little too easy for the Players and if the players, uh, if the students get these cards, it just makes their scores artificially inflated. Uh, so I, had, you know, where I sleeved all of my cards before, I have a few cards which I have unsleeved for that reason because I don't use them. Um, so the first two, and now one, the, the, they're actually from Times Square. So if you mix your things in, but just just be aware of the powers of the heroes. And if you think that they're unfair, then if you choose not to use them, just make sure that you're consistent with that, that you don't use them for everybody. So I'm looking here at Keon and Su Yan. Uh, they both have the same power where, uh, as a hero, they can just you can just um, activate their ability, roll a, a six-sided dice, and add that many survivor cards. So if you roll a six, you're adding six survivor cards. So there's a potential of getting up to 24 survivors for nothing. You didn't even kill any zombies. So that, to me, is just one I don't ever use in the class. Um, and there's also Granny and Alana. Uh, I don't use these ones uh, because they have similar powers. Uh, so Granny says that you roll one die, and uh, if you roll a four plus, you remove that many level one or two zombies. So again, you're removing zombies for not doing any math. It's just a case of how lucky are you. If you're lucky, you roll a four, you remove four zombies, five, you remove five zombies, six, you remove six zombies, provided you have that many on the board. But still, it's just like, you know, I don't want to, I want the game to be about, you know, uh, a reward for 
their effort and for their cleverness in the manipulation of the numbers, not because they got lucky in rolling one dice for one of their heroes. And then Alana says, um, roll a dice and uh, power it up, so you square it, and then you remove that many zombies who have numbers lower than that. But they have to be at the barricade. But it's, again, one of those things where you're removing zombies for just the power of a hero, not because you cleverly manipulated things on the board or the dice or whatever. So I, I, those ones are four that I don't include. Um, and I, if you're going to be doing things, setting things up the way that I would, then those are the ones I'd definitely be removing in your classroom as well. Uh, but again, you know, just look before you play the game, make sure you look through the heroes and that you think that all the heroes' abilities are fair. And any that aren't fair, just make sure that you are consistently playing with that throughout your games. Well, that's going to wrap it up for my discussion of City of Zombies. And hopefully now by watching the video, you have a better idea of how you can set this game up in your classroom and how you can uh, get your students becoming um, more confident and stronger with their math skills. Uh, because this game is a really fun, exciting way to do it, and it's just, like I say, the best math game I've ever seen out there. So please do consider this one, and if you have any questions about anything I've talked about today, maybe I wasn't clear on a point, or maybe you just want to you know, bounce some other ideas, please leave me a message in the comments section below, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you have any other suggestions for games you might like to see on the channel, or games you might like me to talk about how I use them in the classroom, again, leave me that message in the comments section below. And while you're down there, please don't forget to hit like and subscribe because that really does help. Well, until next time, I'm Craig Thompson with the Board Game Teacher saying thanks for coming to the classroom. Are you coming back to school with me?